after studying this module you will be able to know about the forensic archaeology the basic concept the process of exhumation who authorizes exhumation and its time limit and understand the techniques involved in dating of the human bones especially when the commingled remains are found forensic archaeology is a relatively new discipline and especially in country like india the key to its meaning is the word forensic which means of or used in a court of law in other words forensic archaeology is concerned with the presentation of archaeological evidence in a court of law in instances where such evidence may be relevant to issues arising in litigation in criminal or civil cases in 1970s and 1980s archaeologists were called in helping criminal investigators in locating excavating and documenting certain type of crime scene evidence involvement of archaeologists increased in the next couple of decades in various types of investigation even including the excavation of mass burials of the victims of modern wars and the recording and recovery of mass fatality events the forensic archaeologist will be working as an expert witness as part of a team of professionals in the conduct of a particular case he or she will not be directly appointed by the court but will be instructed on behalf of one or more of the parties in the case in a criminal case it is far more likely that a forensic archaeologist will be instructed by the prosecution in our setup archaeology is a study of past activities and cultures when archaeology is supplied to legal investigations then it is termed as forensic archaeology the archaeologist uses their skills and various methods to interpret and find the buried and hidden sites of the past activities these skills and methods are applied to modern forensic investigations forensic archaeologist applies their skills and knowledge about proper excavation methods to make sure that the remains are collected in a controlled and forensically accepted manner by employing proper excavation techniques partially or completely buried remains can be excavated without any damage to the evidence the objects in and around the excavated area are also to be searched anything can be included in these objects such as cigarette butt shoe prints but these are the potential grave sites are also searched along with other excavating sites now we talk about the investigation of crime that is the process of exhumation the word exhumation comes from the latin word ex and humation ex meaning out of and humus means ground thus the word literally means out of ground it means authorized digging out of an already buried dead body from the grave in order to establish the cause of death or to decide upon some other relevant fact such as the person's identity exhumation is rarely done in india because in our country the bodies are disposed of by cremation that is burning in hindu religion only certain communities like muslims and christians bury their dead bodies and exhumation is relevant only for them it becomes necessary if at the time of death there were no suspicions and the body was buried without a postmortem later on fresh facts may come to light showing some foul play so a post mortem examination becomes necessary to establish his cause of death exhumation also becomes necessary when the first post mortem was inadequate and it is thought that a second post mortem may bring some more facts to light this basically means exhumation combined with doing a second post mortem the term exhumation is applied only when a proper inhumation that is the ritual burial of the body in a legal and legitimate fashion was done in the first place this difference is not merely academic it has important legal repercussions in india while a proper exhumation can only be done by a magistrate under section 176 of criminal procedure code retrieval of an illegally buried body can be done even by the police under section 174 of crpc now who authorizes exhumation the body can be exhumed only upon the written order from the first class magistrate 
that may be judicial or executive. Coroner system has been abolished in India, but wherever the coroner system exists, coroners can usually order exhumation. The written order is obtained from an executive magistrate. There is no time limit for exhumation in India. The magistrate along with the police officer and the medical officer should report at the spot. The spot of burial is to be identified correctly. This can be done with the help of relatives and other persons related with the disposal of the body. Even the person who has made the coffin can be called to identify the coffin. Besides the location of the grave from some fixed objects like road, tree etc. to be noted. If the map is available, it will be of great help. The entries in the register should also be seen. The relatives are allowed to stay throughout the investigation that is under 176 section 4 criminal procedure code. Now let us understand the exact procedure. Time. Exhumation is usually done in broad daylight. For this reason, the exhumation team should reach the site of burial or the graveyard in the early morning hours. Now who should be present? The magistrate or the coroner ordering the exhumation and the doctor should be present at the site. Identification of the grave. The grave is identified properly with the help of relatives and the official in charge of the graveyard. Now screening of the area. If there are too many curious spectators, the area should be screened off. Professional diggers are then requested to remove soil from the grave. When the coffin becomes visible, the strong ropes are passed beneath the coffin and it is lifted up. Now collection of soil. Soil from above, below and from all four sides of the coffin should be collected and preserved in separate glass jars with the identification tags. In addition, at least two samples must be taken from some distance say around 25 to 30 yards from the grave. This is very necessary in some poisoning cases. For example, if the person is alleged to have been killed by administration of arsenic and arsenic is found in the body after exhumation, the defense may take the plea that the arsenic found in the body reached in the body from the surrounding soil. It is well known that soil may contain traces of arsenic. An examination of soil recovered from around the grave would reveal whether there was arsenic in the surrounding soil or not. Even if arsenic is present in the surrounding soil, it does not necessarily mean that the defense would become very strong. If the concentration of the arsenic found in the body is more than that found in the soil, it clearly indicates that arsenic could not have passively diffused from the soil to the body. Examination in situ. It is customary to open the lid of the coffin once it is brought out of the grave. It not only allows foul gases to escape in open air rather than be released later in the mortuary, but also enables the pathologist to make a quick examination of the remains. When the coffin is opened, the medical officer in charge should first of all examine the body in situ and preferably take photographs. Bones may be friable and may break during subsequent handling. So, in situ examination is often quite helpful. Now, time limit. After correct identification of the spot, the area should be enclosed from the public. The exhumation is carried out in the early hours so that there is less public as well as the digging out work can be completed during the daytime. The identified grave then should be dug carefully up to the depth of 10 to 15 meters and condition of soil, water content and vegetable grown should also be noted down. The grave is further dug up to coffin or corpse and photographs are taken. A sketch may be drawn about the position of coffin and body. At this point, it should be identified by the relatives. The plastic sheet or a plank may be lowered down to the level of the corpse, then it is shifted to plank and taken out carefully to avoid artifacts. No disinfectant should be sprinkled on the body. In case of skeletonization of the body, the grave is further drug and the skeleton is lifted to sheet or plank. The soil to be searched for small objects like bullets, teeth, hired bone, metallic objects. If the body cannot be transported or the mortuary is very far off, then autopsy can be carried out at the spot itself. Any fluid and debris in the coffin should also be collected. 
Injuries if present should be carefully noted. The injuries on soft parts may get distorted or disfigured due to decomposition. Thus care should be taken to interpret them correctly. The possibility of artifacts during the process of digging should be excluded. In suspected poisoning, viscera should be kept for analysis if possible. If organs are converted into a mass, then loose masses to be preserved. If nothing is found, then hair, soil, teeth and bone should be preserved. About half kilogram of earth is to be collected from the top, sides, bottom of the body and kept in dry clean bottles for the chemical analysis. A portion of coffin and burial cloths must be removed in order to exclude any possibility of contamination from the external sources. Though there is no time limit for exhumation in India, the period is restricted to 10 years in France whereas in Germany it is 30 years. Now if we see or if we found the bundle of bones, how to proceed further? At times some skeleton remains may be recovered from an open land ditches, rubbish dumps, etc. or a skeleton may be exhumed from a temporary grave, a burial ground or even while new constructions. The bones should be listed and the photographs are preferably taken. The bones should be arranged in an anatomical position of articulation. If some earth, sand, dust, etc. is sticking to the bones, it is to be cleaned by brushing. Then the general examination of bones should be done. The bones are thoroughly examined as to whether the bones are dry, clean, brittle and whitish in color with cartilages attached or whether they are moist and humid, yellowish or yellowish brown with soft tissues still attached and cartilage adhering. The stage of putrefaction of soft tissues should also be noted. The second step is the cleaning of the bones. The soft tissues can be separated by boiling in water containing sodium bicarbonate for about 6 to 12 hours and then brushing gently. Now the examination proper. Whenever a skeleton remains or a single bone is brought for examination to the forensic anthropologists or forensic experts, the following questions need to be answered. Like whether they are actually bones. Sometimes pieces of stones may be mistaken by the police officers for bones. For this proper examination, looking for the protuberances, surfaces, borders, etc. is necessary. Then second question is whether the bones are human or animal. Human skull is commonly mistaken for that of the chimpanzee, gorilla or monkey. The bones can be differentiated from that of an animal from the anatomical configuration. In an animal skull, glabella is more prominent, nasion is deeper, jaw is protruded and the cranium is small in size. In human pelvis, Iliac crest and upper border of symphysis pubis lies in the same plane, whereas in animals they lie in different planes due to different postures while walking. Precipitant tests being species specific would be helpful when the remnants of blood are still attached to the surface of bones. Then the next question is whether they belong to one or more than one individuals. The bones are arranged in anatomical position. And if all the bones fit properly, snugly and anatomically and there being no disparity between the bones of the contralateral side or duplication and all bones belong to same age and sex, it suggests that the bones are of same individual. Then the race of the person to whom the bones belong. Race of the individual can be known from the cephalic index that is 70 to 75 when the skull is dolicocephalic in pure Aryans. 76 to 79.9 in mesatycephalic skulls of Europeans and 80 to 84 in brachycephalic skulls of Mongoloids. The other indices which are used to determine race are the brachial index, rural index and humorofemoral index. The sexing of bones gives definite results only after puberty. The sex of the person can be determined from the subjective and objective parameters. The subjective parameters include the examination of different bones determining the sex such as the pelvis, skull, long bones, mandible, sacrum, sternum and clavicle etc. When the bones are strong having rough surface, marked muscular markings and well marked prominences and tubercles they belong to males. The average weight of Indian male skeleton is about 4.5 kilograms and an average Indian female is about 2.5 kilograms. 
children attain half the adult weight by about 12 years in case of boys and 11 years in case of girls. The pelvis is the best bone used for the purpose of sexing. The accuracy for sexing from different boards according to Krogman is from pelvis 95 to 96%, skull 90 to 92%, skull and pelvis together 98 to 99%, only with the help of long bones 80%. The objective indices for determining sex include the sciatic notch index, ischiopubic index, pelvic index and the Kell index. Now next question is the what is the age of the person to whom those bones belong? The age of the person can be determined from the ossification and union of the bones, state of dentition, closing of sutures, state of calcification of laryngeal cartilages sternum and hyoid bone, condition of the symphysial surface of the pubic bone, changes in the sacrum and mandible, extent of wear and tear in both the jaws with aging and changes like bony lipping, osteoporotic and osteoarthritic changes. Epiphyseal union is about 2 years earlier in females compared to males. The age changes after 25 years and in old age can be ascertained from the changes in the mandible. Vertebra pubic symphysis and internal bone structure. Now the next question comes to what is the stature of the individual? The stature is determined fairly accurately using the long bones such as femur, tibia, humerus or radius. The tibia being the best bone for this purpose if it is sublabial. The Hepburn's osteometric board is used for the purpose of measuring the length of the bones accurately. The length is then by the multiplication factors as devised by Pan and Nat. The stature can also be devised by using regression formulae uh, as devised by the various researchers such as Carl Pearson, Trotter and Glasser. Now identifying features is specific. The person's identity can be established from the teeth, any congenital peculiarities, any bone diseases or deformities such as caries, osteoarthritis, malunited fracture, spinal deformities supernumerary ribs and cervical ribs etc. When the skull is available, the superimposition technique can be used by comparing the skull with the photograph of the individual. The next question is the nature of injury. The bones should be examined as to whether there are many sharp cuts or any fractures implying use of blunt weapon or from a vehicle or sometimes they are gnawed by animals when the soft tissue are attached. The charred and blackened bones are suggestive of burns. But in case of intense heat of fires, the bones turn to ashes and are so brittle as to turn to powder when touched. Superficial bones when burnt will allow evidence of heat fractures, charring and cracking, splintering and calcining. Whereas bones lying embedded amidst thick soft tissues will show molten or guttered condition. A bone when burnt in open fire will become white but when burnt in close fire is black or ash grey. Then to how to determine time since death. The nature and circumstances of barrier of the body modifies the rate of decaying of the bone. If the bones are wet and humid and have an offensive order, they are recent. Bodies when exposed to open air gets scrutinized within 7 to 14 days. But when the bones lose their soft tissues, the decaying order will be lost. Because of the groundwater seepage, the buried bones may show increase or decrease of mineral contents for example, calcium phosphate, calcium carbonate, etc., depending upon mineral rich content of the soil. X ray diffraction studies may give an idea about the mineral content of the bone. Following putrefaction, the bones lose their organic constituents and thus become light and brittle, dark or dark brown in color. Such changes depend upon the manner of burial, with or without coffin, the nature of soil of the grave, the age of the individual. Usually the time taken for these to occur varies between 3 to 10 years. In case of burial in mass graves, often shallow graves without any coffin, putrefaction will occur rapidly. Long buried bones may have chalky texture. Bone marrow and periosteum may persist in the bones for several months after the burial. Superficially buried bones may expand or crack within few years by repeated freezing or thawing. When burial is old, the cancellous bone at the metaphysis and epiphysis may get eroded by the effects of weather. In case of fracture, the time may be judged with some accuracy by examining the callus by cutting it longitudinally 
as globulin disappears rapidly, precipitin tests on 10 years old samples becomes negative. Now let us see the dating of human bones if they are found. The examination of the bones rarely if ever permits a precise estimate of the time interval since de deposition in the ground. At the same time it is possible and important to decide whether they are ancient or modern bones that the interval is greater or lesser than 50 years. In recent years a considerable amount of research has been carried out in an attempt to increase the accuracy of dating skeletal remains. Some of these depend upon sophisticated laboratory techniques such as the radiocarbon analysis which are difficult and expensive to perform. Radiocarbon is essentially a tool for archaeologists and its forensic use is limited because of the insignificant fall in the carbon-14 content of bones during the first century after death. This is the stumbling block for many physical and chemical methods for bone dating as although old samples in excess of 100 to 200 years can fairly readily be differentiated from recent bones. Discrimination between the dates of skeletal remains recent enough to be of interest to law enforcement agencies is too poor to be of much practical use. The environmental conditions are more potent than age in causing progressive degeneration of the bone. Even different parts of the same skeleton and even opposite ends of the same long bone may be quite different in their chemical and physical properties. If local changes in inhumation such as drainage are marked, bones in wet peaty soil may be decalcified and crumble within two decades. Yet bones in dry gravel or sand may remain almost pristine for millennia. Naked eye appearances are very deceptive, but bones with the remnants of periosteum tax of ligament or soft tissues other than adipose ear are likely to be less than 5 years old unless kept in a dry protected place. A soapy texture of the surface from residual fat also indicate a date of less than a few decades. The various laboratory tests used for the purpose of dating human remains include the following but results of each test should be interpreted in the light of others and with due regard to the macroscopic appearance and the fullest information of the place of concealment and any circumstantial evidence like nitrogen content. New bones contain 4 to 4.5 gram percent of nitrogen derived mostly from the collagenous stroma. After a variable interval following death usually longer than 60 to 100 years this declines. A value of 2.5 gram percent usually indicate an age of at least 350 years. Amino acid content. Amino acid content is estimated by autoanalyzer after acid hydrolysis of the residual protein. Up to 20 acids may be found in bones less than a century old. They then decline in number and concentration. Earlier work using thin layer chromatography suggested that praline and hydroxyfluorine that is the constituent of collagen vanished by about 50 years but the more sensitive modern methods of analysis do not confirm this. In the blood pigments, the blood remnants may be found up to a century using the most sensitive though non-specific tests. As benzidine have carcinogenic activity, other tests such as phenophthalene and leukomalakite green can detect blood only up to 5 to 10 years using either bone dust or the periosteal surface as the test area. Then fluorescence. Fluorescence can be seen across the whole fleshly sawn surface of a long bone under ultraviolet light for more than a century. But beyond this time, declining fluorescence is seen advancing from both the outer surface and the marrow cavity. The sandwich of fluorescence progressively narrows during the first 50 years and may vanish with within 300 to 500 years. And immunological activity. Eluted extracts of bone when tested against animal anti-human serum gives a visible antibody antigen reaction either in crossover electrophoresis or by passing diffusion in gel. Early work suggested that this persisted for 5 to 10 years, but recent repetition of the test indicated that it ceases within, within months of death. Then cause of death, presence of depressed comminuted fracture, cut injury or bullet wounds in the skull, fracture dislocation of the vertebral column, fracture of ribs, hyard or any other limb bones will be informative, pointing towards the cause and nature of death. Metallic poisons like arsenic, 
lead, antimony, mercury, etc., can be detected in the bones long after death. Arsenic can be recovered even from the examination of charred bony fragments. From the type and depth of cut in the bone, the nature of the offending weapon can be made out. Now, to summarize the topic, forensic archaeologists apply their skills and knowledge about proper excavation methods to make sure that the remains are collected in a controlled and forensically accepted manner. In India, while a proper exhumation can only be done by a magistrate under section 176 of Criminal Procedure Code, retrieval of an illegally buried body can be done even by the police under section 174 of the CRPC. The body can be exhumed only upon the written order from the first class magistrate, whether judicial or executive. There is no time limit for exhumation in India. The period is restricted to 10 years in France, whereas Germany it goes up to 30 years. The bone should be listed and the photographs are preferably taken. The bone should be arranged in an anatomical position of articulation. If some earth, sand, dust is sticking to the bones, it is to be cleaned by brushing. 